Hey, good morning, everyone. Hi. Um, so I think we're going to get started now. My name is Elizabeth Kwan. Um, I'm a nursing student and nursing assistant in Sydney, Australia. So like, if you can't understand my accent, I apologize <laughs> in advance. Um, uh, and this is Monica Geiger. She um, has a doctorate in nursing, and she's currently um, on an impressive career in public health. So um, I'm going to be asking her a few questions um, about her experience um, with employment and um, any struggles um, related to TS and how she's kind of overcome them. And then we're going to be doing a Q&A session where um, you guys can share your own experience and um, things that work for you. Okay, so um, first I wanted to ask, what kind of um, challenges have you ex experienced maybe like when seeking a job in the workforce? That's a great question. So when seeking a job in the workforce, I would say I, I wanted to go for my passion and, and don't let anything hold you back. Um, I... When it comes to specific challenges related to um, TS, so I was, so currently I work in public health and I did have to go undergo a medical screening. So that was a little nerve wracking, um, but that didn't preclude me from applying for the job and, and going for it. So I would say that uh, for me at least, it, there wasn't many challenges in terms of applying for opportunities um, because my opinion was I was going to go for it no matter what and let them tell me no. Um, and uh, th that was kind of the attitude I had um, uh, when, when seeking employment. I was going to go until somebody told me, hey, look, this is not going to work. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't let anything hold me back. Even if I thought I wasn't going to get it, I would still go for it anyway and let them tell me no. Yeah, I think that's really important to really keep on trying for um, the job that you want. In my own personal experience, um, the first time I interviewed um, for a job that I really wanted, um, I kind of misinterpreted a lot of the questions that the interviewer asked me. And um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to get the job at the time. And I kind of had to um, like re-strategize um, and create a new plan. And um, I went around to all my friends who had um, similar jobs or worked at the place that I wanted to work at and ask them um, what kind of uh, questions the interviewer asked them and how they um, answered the question and kind of assess what the um, what kind of answers the employer was seeking and um, this kind of ties into the um, next session with the role playing but yeah I kind of had to um, really rehearse my um, uh, job interview so that I felt um, confident enough. And um, I think like around um, the third time, like after I had had a couple of um, like actual experiences for interviewing um, for the job, then I was more confident and I could give clear answers that um, kind of aligned with what the employer wanted to hear and um, then I was able to get the position that I wanted. That's a great point. And I would definitely say practice, practice, practice. Practice makes perfect. You know, if you want to nail that interview, if you want to get that job, practice, practice, practice. Practice in the mirror. Practice with your cat, practice with your dog, practice with your parakeet, uh, practice with your brother and sister, even though they've had it, heard it a million times. Um, you know, practice makes perfect for sure. Yeah, now I want a parakeet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and then um, what kind of um, challenges then did you maybe face once you actually got the job? I think that like with um, TS, um, we might face like a lot of like organizational struggles oh, yeah. or um, challenges with executive function. What was it like for you? 
<laughs> That's a great question. So um, what it was like to, for me, so I have um, obviously, you know, I have some difficulties focusing and getting myself organized. So I think that was kind of the, that has been the biggest hurdle that I've faced um, with employment. So I was actively researching and seeking out strategies um, to get through that, to strategies to keep organized, strategies to keep focused. I tried, uh, I, I tried many different strategies. Um, having white noise in the background would help me focus. You know, I tried uh, checklists, that always helps me. And then I would ask my peers like for suggestions like, hey, you know, um, what, what strategies do you use for organization uh, to be able to focus? Um, and everybody's different on what strategies will work for them, but I like to do a lot of color coding. Um, all, of my, uh, all of my appointments, my meetings are color coded, so I know which ones I need to go to, uh, which ones are, are, are what's what in my day. So the first thing, but um, the first thing I do in the morning is, is make my checklist to-do list. Um, and, and it's fulfilling at the end of the day when you're able to check off everything. And so checklists, color coding, I, I've tried it all. And, and I would encourage you guys to try it all. And don't be afraid to ask for help or ask for suggestions from your peers. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. Ask for suggestions. Be open about, hey, you know, I'm struggling a little bit in getting myself organized. What strategies do you use to keep organized throughout the day? What strategies do you use to keep focused? People are different. Some people like absolute quiet when they're working. Some people like background noise when they're working. So figure out how you work best and create that environment for yourself. I heard earlier in the conference, someone was saying that putting things away was actually not a good strategy for them because out of sight, out of mind, right? So all their important papers, they left them out in front of them. And I thought that was awesome. My desk is always cluttered. <laughs> And I think I work better that way because I have what I need for the day right in front of me so that I don't uh, gloss over it. Um, and I do when I, uh, I tend to, so when I'm working on something, I tend to go back and double check and check again because I'm one of those people who, you know, might get busy on something else and and you know I might miss something so I I really need to take my time and proofread what I'm doing and you know a lot of times in the workplace we're really encouraged to go 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 and get things done super 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 quickly um, but by doing that, I find that I make careless mistakes. So it's okay to procrastinate a little bit. Um, and it's okay to procrastinate a little bit, do something, and then, um, and, and then go on to your next task, and then come back to that first task to look over your work before you actually uh, submit it or, you know, present it to your supervisor or whatever the case may be. It, it, and I, I'm, I'm giving you guys a freak pass. You can procrastinate. It's okay to take your time in, and do things the correct way, especially with us and with me, where I need to be able to focus um, and, and give that work a second look over before I actually submit it. And, and that's a strategy that has worked for me. So I'll, I'll write something, I'll do something, um, and then that task is complete, but before I submit it, I want to give it a second look, maybe a little bit later in the day, um, with fresh eyes, right? Uh, and, and even though I have a deadline, I try not to rush what I'm doing, because then it won't be quality work. So that's, that, that has been my experience, and, and I hope that that helps some folks. Yeah, I think that um, with Turner syndrome, I've kind of um, came to the point where I've like accepted that things will take um, extra time, extra effort for me, and to kind of like anticipate that instead of um, thinking that like you'll be able to 
get things done quickly, get it done like the first time. Like you need to really set out extra time for yourself, double check, triple check, and yeah, really allow yourself that room. I think that's really important. And also when we talked before, you mentioned um, teaming up with someone who might have um, different strengths to you, someone who could kind of um, fill in the gaps or compliment you. Has that, um, have you found that that uh, worked well for you in the past in your employment? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so we've talked about how um, how we're very verbal learners, right? And we learn a certain way, and we have very we have specific strengths. Um, and so I like to when I'm working to try to seek out people who are strong in the areas that I need work. And then we can complement each other, right? I might have some strengths where somebody else doesn't. They might have some strengths that I need. So use, that, use other people. Don't be afraid to work with other people who are strong in those areas. Um, maybe I'm a verbal learner, but my coworker is more of a visual spatial learner. So we complement each other very well and we're able to get tasks done because we're able to draw on each other's strengths and we can complement each other. So I would say if you're looking for employment and, and seek out those peers and those coworkers who can complement you well um, and be able to, uh, to make each other stronger, right? Um, because we're, we have very specific strengths, everyone has their strengths um, and, and we can complement each other. So I think that's a really great strategy is to actively know your strengths and what you need to work on. Know where you're strong, know, know what areas that you need to improve. And um, the knowledge is power. If you don't know your own strengths and you don't know your own areas that need improvement, you know, you you really need to know that because that's how you succeed is by knowing yourself and by then by knowing yourself you can actively seek strategies and and seek co-workers who complement you and be able to work well together um so i would definitely suggest to, to seek those people out first of all you know uh, evaluate yourself evaluate your own strengths and areas of improvement and 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 then seek out co-workers who complement you uh, in those areas. Yeah, I think it's really important to know um, uh, not just what you aren't good at, but also what you are good at. So yeah, if, you're, if you have really strong verbal skills to really um, focus on that and put yourself mm -hmm. um, in an environment or in a work setting where you actually get to use those um, verbal skills instead of say if you have like slower processing speed um, like me. Um, uh, I remember Dr. Mooney told me do not work in the emergency room. Stay <laughs> far, far away from there. And I, from day one I was like okay Dr. Mooney told me not to go there. <laughs> Yeah, but that, that's the truth. You might, um, you know, accelerate in certain areas that um, your peers don't, and yeah, there might be differences, but that's absolutely fine. We can all work together to, yeah, create a good working environment. Absolutely. Build on those strengths, because we have so many strengths, and I've seen so much talent in this conference, um, and, and so much beautiful, beautiful uh, opportunities and, and some amazing strengths that we all have. Yeah. And um, now I just wanted to um, ask you about accommodations. Um, in your experience, have you ever used accommodations or asked for accommodations? What has that been like for you? That's a great question. So growing up, um, you know what? Asking for accommodations was kind of taboo, right? You didn't want to be that that person, right? That that needed extra help in school. You didn't want to be that person that needed extra accommodations. And and so I didn't ask for any accommodations. And looking back now, I think I would have excelled in in undergraduate uh, university probably more 
uh, if I had asked for those accommodations. So I would say, you know, if you need an accommodation, ask for it. We have to get away from that stigma of not, you know, of, of not wanting to ask for accommodations or things. It's okay to ask for accommodations and you have the right to ask for accommodations um, through the, the equal opportunities, um, equal, sorry, these acronyms are getting me confused, EEOC. Um, equal Opportunities Employment Commission. Thank you very much. You have rights as workers, um, and we have we have rights as as in the workforce, and we have rights as students in university to be able to ask for these accommodations. And looking back, I wish I would have asked for those accommodations, but I was affected by that social stigma that you know you don't want to be that person that makes trouble or that person who asks for the accommodation. I'm here to tell you, ask away ask away um, and because you have that right to be able to uh, have the environment that you need to work at your best uh, to be able to be your best self and have the best chance of success um, wherever you're at so I would say please ask ask for the accommodations you need and be very open about it if you need extra time on an ex uh, on exams ask for it work with your um if if you're in a university you know they have centers uh um for for students where you can ask for uh, accommodations um in the workforce again it's your right as a professional um to to ask for certain accommodations based on your needs so don't be afraid we got to get away from that stigma yeah, I think there's a lot of um, stigma around accommodations and um, asking for them can be really scary. Um, personally, I grew up in a country where disability services were pretty much non-existent and that was really hard for me. So even um, in my university studies, um, I really struggled. And then um, I decided to make the move back to Australia where there was a lot of accommodation opportunities, um, a really well-structured um, disability accommodations team that were really supportive. And even though asking for accommodations was really scary, and I almost felt like a bit guilty, like, do I even deserve this? Mm -hmm. But then when I actually received the accommodations and went through a, um, a school semester with them, it was the most freeing thing, actually. I felt like the um, playing field was leveled. I was actually given a fair chance to you know, study amongst my peers. Um, and like, um, there's a lot of talk about um, equality and equity, but this is really just equity. We're all now at the same level, given the same chances to achieve you know, the same goals that we are all striving towards, yeah. Um, now I want to um, take a moment to um, uh, take questions from the audience. Is there um, any experiences with um, employment um, in TS or any questions that you might have for Monica? Yes. I have a question just about when you were just talking about accommodation. Yes. Um, that's a really good question. So um, in my case, I'm not sure exactly if, how... If you could just repeat the question first for the oh, recording. Okay. Yeah. Um, so so make sure we the question um, was that uh, with Turner syndrome, do you uh, basically immediately qualify for um, accommodations um, or do you need to be under certain um, classification um, in order to receive these accommodations? Um, so in my ex experience, um, uh, yeah, I apologize that I don't know exactly how it works in the um, US, but um, with my um, university, for example, 
um, I actually just had um, a, a meeting with the disability team to kind of explain what Turner syndrome is and how that um, impacts my life and um, they were really understanding towards that but then I know that also um, with um, Turner syndrome some people might um, fall under other diagnostic categories such as ADHD or autism spectrum or nonverbal learning disorder and um, so if you have those other types of formal diagnosis, um, then that might actually help you um, to qualify for accommodations. So it might not actually be through the Turner syndrome diagnosis, but other, um, so to say, com comorbidities that um, uh, you might be experiencing. And Yeah, and, and um, each, each uh, employer and each university is also going to handle things differently, right? So I think it comes down to um, knowing your university's policy, knowing your employer's policies very well when it comes to disability and knowing exactly what they're looking for and working with your doctor um, to make sure that they're uh, writing, you know, exactly what what the employer is looking for because um, a lot of times it does come down to verbiage um, and you want to make sure to know that policy inside and out so that what your doctor puts on paper matches the policy of the the organization um, the company wherever you're seeking employment or or studies and uh, you can go ahead and okay, yeah. take um, the next question uh, the lady in the back I think that's really important. Um, so the question was um, uh, about the unpredictability of your day um, uh, within um, your work schedule and also um, relationships with um, your coworkers mm -hmm. while you're working. Monica, did you want to answer that? Yeah, so I worked as a staff nurse. Um, we work 12 hour shifts and of course we're expected to respond to emergencies. So our day is very, very unpredictable. Um, I might have to drop everything. Um, I, I, Obviously, I'm going to have to drop everything if an emergency comes up and I might have to leave what I'm doing um, to go attend to an emergency and then have to try to come back and get my thoughts together about what I was doing before that. And, <laughs> and that's not an easy thing and, and not just for us, for anybody, you know, having that sort of unpredictable uh, work day. Um, and so what I would would what I would do at least is first of all I would make sure to be saving my work at every possible moment um, as frequently as I could um, you know whether that work was charting or writing something down and then again making that checklist in the morning really helped me keep on track because I would check off the task when I was done. If I had to run to an emergency, when I came back, I would look at my checklist and I would see, oh, that's right, I was doing that. Um, so that really helped me. Writing down as much as I could would help me. 
Um, and um, so those are some of the strategies that I would use as a nurse, you know, having that kind of unpredictable day um, that might not go exactly the way you plan. Actually, you would almost never go exactly the way that I that I had planned it to. Uh, there's kind of not no such thing as a normal day. Uh, so uh, I, I definitely feel you there. Um, and and also, you know, again, talking with your peers and and getting advice. Like, how do you handle this situation? Because obviously, I've I, I've never worked in that sort of setting. So you might have peers that have some better, more tailored advice to uh to to fit more um your your uh your your work setting yeah and um i think also um if you're working in such an unpredictable environment then um and if you can't change your um workplace um setting then make sure that your home life is as predictable as possible. So That's like when point. you come home, make sure that your environment is quiet. You can rewatch your favorite TV show, put on some noise canceling headphones, really take that time for yourself to zone out, eat your favorite food, your comfort food, make your home life as predictable as possible. That's some great advice. And then the second part of your question, I'm sorry, was um, about relationships with, uh, with coworkers. Um, and so what, what I have found with coworkers is what has helped me is growing up, I, I was a theater kid. I liked doing drama and I liked doing improv. And role playing really, really helped me um, with relationship building. So I would say seek out opportunities, role play it. Role play it with your family, role play it with your dog, with your cat, with whoever you can get to listen to you. Role play those situations. And if you have a local improv group that you are able to join, I would highly suggest it for anybody in the room. Um, I absolutely love improv and it really helped me to be more flexible and responsive to unpredictable situations. Because when you're doing improv, it's not scripted. You don't know what the other person's going to say, right? So, and, and it's a safe place for you to, to role play different scenarios, different situations, and learn about yourself and how you would react to those different uh, situations. So that's, that's what I would suggest for that. Yeah, I think that's really important. And um, there's an Australian um, actress who's autistic, and um, she says that neurodivergent people actually make the best actors because they're expected to act all the time throughout the um, you know, professional and private life. So yeah, um, not to be like faking it, but just to um, practice enough that you feel um, confident to be your best self. I think that's really important. That's so important. Thank you. Um, yes. Yeah, so just to repeat what you said, just in case people didn't hear, to make sure to work with your human resources department and work within your, your company, your employer, within the organization to be able to, to make sure you have the accommodations you had. And I'm sorry, I think you had a question? Sort of do that with your boss, but some bosses may be too busy to like. 
Well, I'll say, like yeah, a absolutely. No, I'll try my best to 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 express to you what what I've found helpful for me. Um, and in, in my workplace, um, you know, I'm lucky to have a very supportive supervisor who, who checks in with me on a weekly basis. We have a standing meeting. Um, uh, we have a standing meeting once a week. Um, and that's been and that's been scheduled there for a long time. If you have that standing meeting and that expectation that, hey, I'm going to meet with you on this day, at this time, and maybe maybe you don't need a weekly meeting, maybe it's bi-weekly or monthly or whatever your needs happen to be, but work with your, I would say work with your supervisor to get that meeting on the books. If they're busy, schedule, make sure it's scheduled, make sure it's on their calendar so they can plan for that. Um, and I also have a meeting with my peer, with my coworker once a week. Um, so I would say even if it's just a short 30 minute meeting or if even if it's just a short lunch, um, I would make that, um, I, I would definitely try to make that time and make the effort uh, to meet with that person on a regular basis, um, the people that you need to talk to, uh, to be able to, to succeed. Um, and if your supervisor is not open to that, um, then it might not be the right work environment for you. Um, and, and that might be something that you, that you need to consider. Do you have anything to add to that before we take the next? No, I think that's really important that there's um, regular communication. And um, if there's not a specific um, uh, time where you're expected to meet with your employer, then maybe um, you can reach out to them and say, like, hey, I need to, like weekly check-ins or fortnightly check-ins to discuss um, where I'm at or um, what kind of um, areas I need support and to yeah, just um, advocate for yourself and mm -hmm. to really block out that time so that there's that um, open communication. And you, sometimes you have to keep them honest, keep reminding them, keep uh, bugging them, and most importantly, know your own rights. Know, um, know the law, know, know your workplace policies. That is so important to know what you're entitled to. Um, and the Department of Labor on their website has some great resources, um, as well as EEOC, um, which again is the Equal Employment and Opportunities Commission. Um, and they're the ones who actually enforce the Americans for Disabilities Act. So they would be the one that that you would file a complaint with if you were to need to um, and they're the ones that that enforce that so thank you you want to take the next one Yeah, yeah. So if, if I'm hearing correctly, um, your question is about communicating with your supervisor and, and how you can communicate with them when they're not necessarily open to communication or um, you mentioned that uh, you had scheduled your vacation time and then all of a sudden your supervisor came back and said, hey, you know, you're not um, I, I can't approve your your vacation and all of a sudden you have to come back to work. Yeah. 
And then she unapproved it, yeah. And and I hear that kind of uh, I hear that kind of thing happens a lot here here in in the workplace. Um, so in terms of communicating with your supervisor, I would say uh, first of all communicate frequently um, and communicate. Um, and, and again, know your workplace's policy. What is your workplace's policy on vacation? Do they, um, once the vacation is approved, what's the policy? Can, um, you know, are you, you know, what are, what are your rights to take vacation? And, and, you know, we do have a right to take the vacation that we're entitled to. Um, Yeah. Um, we'll have to move on to the next question. I'm sorry. Um, yes. How do you handle constructive criticism? Because oh, that's a good one. When, when I receive it, it just makes me emotional. And yeah. I know that it comes from a good place. Yeah, even though it's not meant to be taken personally, we're human. <laughs> so a lot of times we do take it personally, right? And that's... Oh, yeah, good Point. Um, the question was about um, managing constructive criticism. Yeah, so um, I, I think that's that's a great thing. And as humans, we you know it's our natural instinct to take take uh, criticism personally, and and that's that's a human thing, you know. Um, so I would say um, that that's a great point. So first of all, when you get that criticism to take it back and think about it before you respond. Because when you get that criticism, and your first reaction is to be emotional, as you mentioned. So I would say don't react in that minute. Give yourself, give yourself time to take in you know, what, you, what you heard, to take that in and to think about it and think about it before you respond. Because if you respond right away, you're gonna be emotional. But take that time to really think about what was said um, and to think about how, um, you know, how you might want to work on some of those issues or if that criticism is something you can work on or if that's, you know, uh, think, I would say take a beat without knowing the exact situation. I would say take a moment sit down before you respond, take that moment, take a breath, and really think about it before you send off that email, before you respond, so that you're not emotional. So I would say take a step back. Yeah, um, and yeah. just to quickly add, um, rejection and sensitivity is definitely a thing um, in neurodivergency. And um, I've uh, seen like this lady who's neurodivergent, um, she actually keeps affirmations and her accomplishments visible um, in her working space. And she mm -hmm. finds that that really helps her in times when she feels discouraged. So I think that's definitely um, another thing that you can um, easily implement. And then rehearsing, you know, um, role playing, again, role play some situations um, that might help you to be less emotional when the actual situation comes up. And if I can make a book recommendation, uh, there's a book called Crucial Conversations that I think uh, um, everybody would benefit from. Uh, Crucial Conversations is a book about how to have those difficult conversations, not just in the workplace, but in your personal life as well. How to have that conversation um, that, you know, is hard to have with your boss, with your peer, with your, you know, with your partner, whoever, whoever it may be. Yes. Thank you. It's yeah. a great point. Great and I comment. think it's really important to have a regular um, psychologist or therapist that you can see because then they're able to advocate for you and write um, official documents. So then um, with those kind of um, uh, 
state by state insensitive, you'll actually have official documents that you can present um, present to them instead of like you just advocating f for yourself alone. Yeah. Absolutely, that's that's uh, actually a really awesome thing. And even if you're, um, she's talking about making. Uh, so she she talked about making a, a specific plan. I think it's a five zero. So it's a st state specific. Five zero four plan. So um, and, and and to add on to that. Um, you having a plan for yourself and writing down these are exactly the things I need um, is a great practice, even if it's not uh, an official document. Um, I think that's a great practice to be able to write down these are the things that I need to be able to work and, and to be able to be my best self at work. Um, and yeah, okay, do you want to take the next one? Um, yes, yeah, the lady in the green jacket. Yeah, so um, the advice just now was to bring in your um, career counselor that you might have used in um, college and help uh, get them to help you advocate for your needs in the workplace and so you can make that um, transition smoothly into the next um, stage of your life. And before we, I want to make sure I, I get this in before we have to, before we run out of time is that, you know, we're having this discussion here and this is a safe place and I'm, and this has been such an amazing discussion. And I just want to, to mention that, you know, when we're talking about workplace, um, workplace issues, to be very careful what you post on Facebook and other uh, social media outlets, because I, I, and I'm saying this because I have seen it on the Turner Syndrome Facebook page, which is a public page. Even if you think it's a private group, it is public. It's able to be found. So be very careful, um, you know, what, what you're posting about your employment on Facebook, what you're posting, even if your employer is not specifically named, um, I'll tell you that I have seen people lose opportunities and I've seen people um, get fired because of what they posted online about their job search, about their experience with an employer. Um, so if you need to talk about those kind of things, um, send me a personal message, text, uh, make a phone call. Uh, but I would say Facebook and other social media is not the place uh, to post. Um, employment uh, about your employment. Yes. Okay, so the question was um, for 
people with um, Turner syndrome and nonverbal learning disorder, um, how to deal with anxiety and stress in a service position. You can take that first if you want. Okay. Um, I find that like I definitely um, uh, need to regularly check in with myself. So um, for me, I have regular um, uh, sessions with um, uh, my psychologist booked in. Um, even if I don't like think that like I might necessarily need it, I do have it booked in just to anticipate anything. And like I feel like even if something um, happens to me where I feel emotionally distressed, like I know that I will be able to um, uh, process it later, like with a professional in a safe space, and just to um, have someone to really debrief life with um, uh, regularly. I think really helps because um you know when you're venting to friends and family they might not necessarily um uh know how to support you best and like their listening style might not be you know the kind of um style that you want or you, they might not give you the kind of um reaction that you want so to be able to just um unload that and debrief like in nursing we always do um debrief and you know share what happened on our shift so that's really important like you know um you know personal lives too and um yeah to just have a professional that you can really share like things that are going on so that you can um process that in a safe space i feel that that really helps with my stress and anxiety yeah and and um I, I love that answer i think that was i think you hit the nail on the head um and m making your environment um as as turning your environment into a place where you work best um and whether that's you know putting your accomplishments on the wall or you know having something with you that reminds you or calms you um uh that you know um that you're able to you know when you have a second to to squeeze a i don't know a, a plushie or something that that keeps you calm or um, don't be afraid to bring those things that you need into the workplace to be able to um, help them. Yeah, uh, I help think, yourself. I and think depending on the work setting, you know, if you're in a setting where you can implement, you know, um, th those kind of things like around your desk, like noise cancelling headphones, um, mm -hmm. you know, if you can listen to calm music or have things, uh, pictures or anything that um, calms you, that's um, really important to, um, and if you have certain things that you find calming and um, you're not sure if you're like allowed to have them in the workplace, then just um, communicate with your um, employer and um, get permission to keep those things around you and yep. easily um, reachable. Yeah. That can be part of your accommodations. And I think it's easy. Um, so the question is um, when to disclose your um, uh, uh, accommodation needs to your employer. Um, I actually just had a conversation um, with a friend at breakfast and she told me, do not wait for accommodations. Mm -hmm. Do not wait for an issue to arise. You need mm -hmm. to have them um, in place from the beginning. And um, I think that can make a huge difference in um, your work experience. Monica? No, I, I would echo what you said. Uh, as soon as possible and remind them frequently. Um, and and because that plan may need to be uh, reevaluated on a regular basis, that those accommodations in that plan um, definitely may need to be evaluated on a regular basis. So I would say as soon as possible, maybe even during the hiring process, um, because you don't want to get too far and then realize that that this um, employer is maybe not for you because they can't. Uh, you know they, they they don't offer the right environment for you um or um you know you want to make sure to be open and and not give 
you know, make sure that they, they know what you need so that they can make that work environment uh, the best possible for you. Um, yeah, that's what I said. I, I would say the, the book that I recommended, Crucial Conversations, is a great place to start. And also, um, again, with the role playing. I would definitely role play out that situation. And I think we have time for, what, one or two more questions? We got about five minutes. Um, I would say I, I did have accommodations in college, and that helped me a lot. And in university, uh, what would be the difference? Would it be similar in the workplace as, as I'm looking for work? Um, I think, uh, like the lady before said, um, how she carried on her accommodations from um, college to the workplace. I think it's really important um, in college to figure out what kind of accommodations you need, um, uh, what kind of support you need, and then you can um, implement that um, into your workspace and um, that way um, you already know when you enter the workforce what you need to um, advocate for yourself. Yeah, yeah. And you know, um, the school environment and the work environment might be two different different things. You might need different uh, different accommodations. So I would say reevaluate your accommodation plan with um, with your your healthcare professional, um, with your mental health professional, um, and talk about those needs and write those needs down and reevaluate those needs. Uh, on a regular basis, because those needs might change as as you um, as you mature, as you go through your career. Um, so I would say make sure that you're working with your uh, healthcare professional to first of all identify those needs for the specific workplace setting that you're going to be in, um, and then reevaluate those needs on a regular basis to make sure that. Uh, those needs are being met, number one, and to see if there's anything um, that comes up that you might need uh, additional help with. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I would say. Uh, so it might be the same, might be different, depending on your situation. Unfortunately, we only have time for one more question. So the question was um, how to clear your mind and um, not get overwhelmed in a fast-paced working environment. Monica? Oh, man. Um, so as a staff nurse, I worked 12-hour shifts, and it was a very fast-paced environment. I was lucky if I got a bathroom break, okay? Um, when, when, and that's, that's being absolutely serious. I'm only a little bit joking there. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, you know, I, I would have to go from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next. Um, but, you know, even if it was just for, for two seconds, I just had to carve myself out that time when I needed it. Um, even if it was just one second, as I was going from one place to another, duck into uh, an empty room and just take a breath and then move on to the next thing. Um, but you, uh, so I would say evaluate what your needs are and make sure that you're incorporating those needs into your work day. If you know, if you, and, and knowing yourself is a big part about that, of that, knowing what the signs are when you're getting to that point where you're, you know, you're anxious, you know, you being able to identify that in yourself before it gets to the point where you're burnt out. Um, so make sure, first of all, to be able to identify that in yourself, those signs and symptoms when you're getting to that breaking point, and to then have a plan um, in place before you even set foot into the workplace and say, okay, when I feel this way, this is my plan 
of, of, of what I'm going to do. And, and don't be afraid. I know that in the workplace, you know, it's kind of taboo to ask for help. Um, but you need, sometimes you just need to say to your coworker, hey, can you just take this for two minutes? I just need two minutes to go to the bathroom. You don't even have to tell them what it's about. Just be, I, I, I need two minutes to step away um, and, and take that. The, that two minutes. Yeah. Um, it's, it's so important that, that you're able to do that. Yeah, and to make sure that your break is actually a break. Like yeah. you don't have to pressure yourself to make small talk with um, coworkers during that time. And make sure that you're actually taking a pause for yourself. Like for me, you know, I like to um, take a breather and look at like pictures of my dog or like eat like my favorite snack that I've packed for myself and like make sure that that time is actually designated for yourself and you're know, like not like doing some like extra work on this side. That's a great yeah. point. Because as nurses, we tend to want to go, 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 go. And we, everything is, is urgent. Um, but it's so important that, that we uh, are able to do that for ourselves. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so uh, the suggestion was for meditation, and I think that's a great practice. You know, it, there's um, apps where you can do a uh, one-minute, two-minute, five-minute meditation um, before you start your day or during your lunch break. I mean, if that works for you, that's, that's awesome. Um, meditation is definitely a great tool. Yeah, definitely. And, like, I see you've got your um, headphones with you. I think that's really important. Yeah, and, like... Um, you know, if you're able to use that, use that. Um, I uh, personally, like, I might use AirPods because they can be, like, more discreet and, like, um, less heavy. But, yeah, um, uh, noise counseling headphones are great, too. Even if you could um, just listen to them for, like, two, three minutes, I think that's really important to just take a few seconds to zone out, yeah. And I, I think we're at time now. Yeah, that's the end of the session. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming.